Hi, Seth. Good evening to you. Hey, thank you. Good morning. Good morning to you, <laughs> since we're on the uh, other side of the world, apparently. <laughs> yes, we are. Thank you for saying yes to be interviewed today. My name is Nicolette. I am the creator for the podcast titled You're Worthless. Read that again. The juxtaposition of your very soul. When I read your profile, it is something that found remarkable. A lot of people probably have gone through things like what you have gone through. And, and I am a person who would like to hear and listen to what they had to say once they get uh, to the other side, because I too have experienced some certain things, some, some, some serious things in my life. So mm -hmm. I appreciate you being here and therefore I'm excited to have this conversation with you. <laughs> I would love to read about uh, your introduction to our listeners today and then we can get right into our conversation. How do I pronounce your surname? Oh. Seth Gale. Okay. Yep. All right. Yep. So, hey everyone, we have Seth Gale here with us. Seth Gale is a survivor of childhood abuse and trauma. After his father nearly killed his mother when he was two years old, he grew up with a single mother of three children. Around 10 years of age, his mother be became abusive and addicted to hard drugs like crack and cocaine. This would lead him down a path to being molested by a grown man. After reporting and putting his abuser away, Seth has moved on and done incredible things with his life. Today, he is a soon-to-be author, or maybe an author right now, <laughs> of his upcoming memoir, Strength Beyond the Shadows. He is also an eight-year combat veteran, award-winning construction professional and motivational speaker. He is using his story to provide education, hope, and inspiration to the world and show them how to be resilient even in their darkest day. That is something, Seth. Can you share with us, like, I know it, it's, 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 I read it in your bio, but what was it really like growing up with Seth Gale? Well, it was certainly tough. It, you know, well, growing up without a father is already hard enough. You're already subjected to a lot of different things. Statistically speaking, when you don't have a father, you're more likely to be, you know, a criminal, drug addict, things like that. You're more likely to get into more problems as you get older. So without having a father, I was already in that bad group. Then moving into my mother, who would eventually get kind of abusive, she would start to, well, I say kind of, but she was close hand punching and, and I always grabbed me by the face. And that was like her thing was to grab me by my face. And she slammed my head against the wall a few times. And yeah, when I was like maybe eight, nine, 10 years old, that's when things really started to kind of pick up. And I, you know, I think maybe that's something to do with we were big enough to start getting hit like that. You know, maybe when we were like four, five, six, seven years old, we weren't big enough to like really get abused physically because it probably hurt some little kids. Um, although we would get, I mean, we still got hurt at that age too. But yeah, when, when I remember being like 10 years old and seeing my mom smoke weed with my sisters and they're, we're all a year apart. So, and I'm the middle child. So my sisters would be like nine and 11 smoking weed with my mom and all of her friends. Um, and around that time is when she started to get very, very bad and she was punching us and because of that, the, your home life, you don't have a father, you are you have drugs in the house, and you're getting abused by your mom, um, and there's just no love, like there's no love in the house, you, you find an outlet, right? And so my outlet was, I ended up meeting a guy through a friend, and this guy was like 30 at the time, and would end up hanging out with him uh, on the weekends, and we'd go up there and play video games, and, and hang out, eat pizza, and drink pop all weekend, and it was like a kid's like, dream hangout you know, there was no rules you could do whatever you wanted so i'd go up there friday night saturday night and after about a few after a few months of going there he would begin to molest me and over the course of the next um nearly six years it's about five and a half years it went on i it went on to experience everything you can experience sexually you know he as he proceeded to molest me uh, i was 12 years old my mom was taken away from me that was like a crazy day in, in its own and then, so she was taken away from me. My grandparents would end up adopting me about four or five months later. And uh, I continued to be molested by this guy because I kind of defended him. And I wanted to hang out with him because you kind of get in this like weird psychological like war with somebody. Uh, and it messes you up pretty bad. So then at 13 years old, <clears throat> the guy would end up eventually raping me. And then that would happen a few more times between 13 and 15 but at what right before I turned 15, I reported the guy B 
because he was about to start or he had either already started or he's about to start molesting one of my younger friends who was hanging out with me as well at his house. And so I kind of reported him to stop the whole cycle. I could see it kind of happening while I was up at his house. So I reported him to stop the cycle and uh, protect my friend. And that was back in 2011. And so the guy got 10 years in prison. So he would actually be free today. But fortunately enough, he, he died in prison in 2019 before he was, uh, he was like a year away from getting out and he ended up dying. And so that was, <clears throat> that was, I was basically 16 years old when that happened. I was a month away and then, I, you know, finished up high school, joined the army. And that was like the, the end of my childhood, basically, especially with like all the traumatic things from 16 to 18, nothing really bad happened to me. <clears throat> you know, a couple crazy incidents here and there, but I was doing pretty well from that point forward, aside from, I never had therapy. So I was definitely doing things looking back on it. I know that were wrong and I just didn't realize it at the time, how much my childhood had affected me, you know? So that was like, I guess the, the five minute version of my childhood. And we can talk about whatever bit of that you want to talk about and, and, and dive into that. Um, I don't know. First off, I am so sorry that somebody had to go through through all of that. Um, when I read your profile, I'm like, okay, I don't know if it's right for me <laughs> to interview him because um, I would never imagine that happening to anybody and I wouldn't want any anybody to experience those kind of things. Um, and for you to be out here, to be talking to strangers, myself, like for those listening, we we haven't even had any contact prior to this interview today. And today is the first time hearing it from Seth himself. Yeah. Okay. It's a, it's, yeah. yeah. I know, I know it's, I know it's a lot to digest. Um, it and is. It, like and when for I you put to the... smile right now, like Seth, you have my respect and I'm sending all the love and light your way. Yeah. I mean, you know, it is what it is. I mean, it's, you know, you, you have a couple options and, you, you know, what else am I supposed to do, right? Am I supposed to sit here and, and cry and uh, yeah. give up and, and just give in to all the, like, the hate and the negative emotion and things like that? Like, you, you know, I don't, I can't do that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you can, but there's, like, one, there's one thing that happens when you do that. Like, if you just give up and, well, there's a few things, but it all eventually leads down one path, which is generally taking your own life, right? So yeah. a lot of people who go through, a like, lot of people who go through that, so... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you have moments? That you oh, feel yeah. Like uh, yeah. I mean, when I was about nine or 10 years old, I I started to contemplate suicide almost daily. I, I remember being like 10 years old and I would sit outside. I would sit, I would sit on the ledge of my bedroom window and it was on the second floor. And I would always think to myself, like, if I just land just right, I'll kill myself. Like I'll die. And so I would always think about like, if I get out the window just right and I land on my head, snap my neck i'll be dead and it'll all be over but on the flip side of that is if it doesn't this sounds twisted but if it doesn't go through now i'm just this like asshole who jumped out his window and you know then you have to deal with the side effects of like the pain and so it's kind of like it's not funny but it's funny yeah yes. <laughs> yeah so it's like you know if you're going to do it you got to do it right and so right. That's, that's honestly like what held me back for a long time uh, but yeah i mean i would think about it daily and then as i even as i got older i just constantly thought about it just constantly wanted to end everything Every time something would go wrong i would think about it i would end up joining the army and then i, I was in the army for eight years and especially the last like six months i was in the army it was really bad it's probably as close as i've ever been to, to ready to kill myself you know I, I had access to a gun and obviously being in the military but then i had my own personal gun too and i just thought about it nonstop. every time something would happen it would send me into like a rage and um, it's like very consuming so when it, you know when you do have those thoughts it'll take over you know it'll take over your whole day like you just it's like a fan it's like a fantasy it's like you think about maybe going to a football game or going to watch a movie like it sounds fun that's kind of how i was with with the suicide things as i was just kind of like random it was just it was just on my mind all the time mm. um it was like uh yeah you just had this like real crazy fantasy about it and and once i got out of the army a lot of the stress went away and i i don't you know i got out of the army i got into a really good job and i started doing really well and a lot of the the thoughts kind of went away suddenly i don't really know what happened but it 
it, they just kind of were gone. So I, it's been about three years now since I've been out of the army, a little over three years. I haven't really struggled with the like depress well, a little bit of depression, but I haven't struggled with like the suicide ideation uh, as much in the last three years. But yeah, certainly for probably the ten to for probably fifteen, sixteen years. I mean, just like daily, daily thoughts. Mm-hmm. Did you say your time in the army has helped you in any way? to curb those thoughts or to just move your thoughts away from whatever that you've experienced before? Yeah. You know, the army was, it was like, uh, it was what I needed for sure. I needed structure because I didn't have like a good mother and a, and a father to like help me. So I didn't have like somebody to teach me different things about money and life and just things like that. So I, the army kind of was like my parent, they were like my parents. And so they, they helped kind of build some structure and, and give me a, a good life. And I had some of my best friends I've ever had in my life while I was in the army. So that, that definitely helps kind of curb the thoughts. On the flip side, the army is also very stressful. And mm-hmm. I would end up eventually getting married and I have two kids. And so I had both my kids while I was in the army. And so, you know, I had my daughter and then I went to Afghanistan. So my daughter was like six months old when I went to Afghanistan. I went to Afghanistan for nine months. And I missed that whole part of her life. She might have been older than that, actually. I think she was like nine months old. So I missed her whole second year of life, basically. And um, that that was tough. And I had a bunch of really bad thoughts while I was there. And so the Army was kind of, it was good in a lot of great ways, but it's also very stressful. And, and when you have like PTSD or the trauma, anytime you get stressed out, it takes you back to those real bad places um, in your head. So mm-hmm. it was there was good and bad from the Army. Right. Well, okay, so. I'm, I'm having an, a mental image of the things that you just mentioned. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So how has your trauma affected your relationships today, in your opinion? Yep. Yeah, great question. A couple, couple things, like, this is kind of an odd one, but I have a affinity for like, uh, like, uh, like male role models. Like I, I get like attached to guys quickly if they're like any kind of role model to me. So I have like coaches. I, I do jujitsu now, and I have coaches that I I get attached to, like a father son kind of feeling to me, like um, just because I admire them. Like I admire what they're doing, and so I just I care a lot about what they think of me, and I always want to make them like proud. I always want to make them happy, and and I also always work hard. Like so, when I go to jujitsu, I always work really hard. I always train really hard um, because I feel like this connection. Um, that I've, I, I'd never had a father in my life. So because of that, you're always chasing that kind of connection. And it's kind of innate to me. It's kind of a weird thing that I can't help. Um, but it's not, it hasn't affected me negatively um, as an adult anyways. Uh, so that's kind of like a weird twist. Um, that, but that's just n- normal for people who grew up without a father. And then <clears throat> as far as being like molested goes and the sexual abuse, because, you know, Everything that you can experience to include sex, I had experienced at, by the age I was thir- uh, age, and that was with all with a grown man. So that messes with you already, right? Yeah. Uh, I knew I wasn't gay. I knew I wasn't like this weirdo. I knew I wasn't, there was nothing wrong with me, but these things were happening to me. And so for a long time, I was scared that I had HIV. I was scared I had AIDS. I was scared to, that was part of the reason why I was scared to report because it went on for, you know, six years. And it, and it happened every single weekend. It, this wasn't like a once a month thing or like every couple months. It was every single weekend of my life. I would go to this guy's house. So probably 45 to 50 weekends out of the year, I was at his house. And, and a lot of those times where I was being molested, it's like most of the time. Because of that, I was very sexually motivated as a young man. So after I reported him, anytime I would talk to a girl, um, I was just really sexually motivated. So I always wanted to have sex, always thought that like, we were going to have sex all the time and that was just like normal and it, and it wasn't obviously i was very aggressive uh, as a young man and i never did anything that you know would get me in trouble i i i, I respected the boundaries but i also did not respect the boundaries so i just assumed that we were going to have sex all the time i just so whenever i'd hang out with girls i'd get very handsy and then you know they would say no and then i would the thing was is i was trying to convince them like like let's do it let's do it let's do it and uh, and I'm not proud of that at all. Like I, I really hate that that happened. And it took me until my adulthood to realize like what had happened and like why I was acting like that. 
And um, there's no excuse for it, really. Um, I just wish I would have had a better understanding. And it's kind of what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to teach people like what happens and why some guys may be experiencing this feeling or even some girls may be experiencing this feeling if girls are sleeping around a lot. There may be a, a reason behind that, you know, and that's kind of what was happening to me. I <clears throat> slept around a lot. And from the time I was 18, excuse me, time I was 18 until I was uh, probably well, until I was married, I, I slept around a lot. So that was the thing I got married when I was 20. And so, uh, you know, for four or five years, whatever, the relationships with girls, I just, they didn't matter. I never, I was never in a relationship with girls until I met my wife. Me, my wife is the first girl that I ever dated. So that was kind of like a weird thing. I would just sleep with girls and leave them alone. You just, it's normal. It's normal for what happened to me to, to experience that behavior later in life and then after you get married it's it's even it's like even worse it's like trying to be you know intimate with somebody and you have different flashbacks and you have different but my wife she used to like jokingly grab my butt and like like any woman would do and i would it, it would just like send a shock through me because like it just takes you back and so you kind of feel like weird and i and we've talked about it like me and my wife are very open about it you know i have to let her know that these things bother me and certain things that you know bother me about intimacy one of them is like um like public display of affection for some reason it it i'm working on it now but it kind of bothers me to be in public and holding hands or kissing or hugging it just for some reason it just bothers me and i attribute it to what happened to me as a kid so um yeah that's like it's affected my relationships in a lot of ways one thing I'm glad it hasn't affected is, is my relationship with my kids. If anything, it's made my kid, me and my kids a lot closer um, because growing up with the way I did and then also being molested for so long, they make it a point that my kids are just in, like an absolute priority and I love them to death. And, you know, there's nothing more important to my children, you know, and I, and I always reinforce that with them. And, and I think I'm a very present father i'm a very focused and intentional father um that's one thing i'll say is maybe beneficial of what happened to me is is i have raised my children to be just very good little kids and i'm very intentional about what i do with them so Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. talk to us about now wife Mm -hmm. how do you think she has helped like what made you think that you want to settle down with her like there must be something that, you, that that happened or something that you say, okay, I'm I'm ready. I want to move forward and I want to build a life. Like she must be really special. <laughs> I, I can. I yeah. Can <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we met when I was in the army. Uh, yeah. We, we met on her birthday. I messaged her and um, I think, I've, you know, I've followed her on Instagram, whatever, messaged her. And uh, she attended a college that was near the army base. And so that's kind of how we, how I found her. And um, I messaged her, asked her if she needed a designated driver for her birthday. She had just turned 21. So I was going to drive her and her drunk friends around. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And uh, she didn't. So I never, I actually didn't hang out with her that day. It was the following weekend. We we hung out, um, Mm -hmm. we got dinner together, we hung out and then it was, it was pretty much it from there. I mean, I don't know. It, we just never turned back. And so, you know, we've had a few rough patches along the way. Um, a few months in, we had a good little patch where it was like, look, I basically had to explain to her that um, of who I was, you know, cause I was just different and I am different and I have my moments and, you know, I have just, I have problems. And so I told her that I told her that a few months in, I was like, look, I'm jacked up and, and I'm just going to let you know, like I've had a terrible life. And so if you want to be with me, like this is, some of the things you're going to have to work with me and deal with. And, and you know, I, she never really, she's never been discouraged about it, which is nice when you walk into a relationship with somebody who's really jacked up and she's not discouraged about that at all. Uh, that's nice, obviously, but she's just, you know, she's, uh, she's basically everything that I'm not, you know? And so it's cool and it feels good to be with somebody like that where like when we first met, I got to meet her family her family is very well off and they're they very well taken care of and um, they've done very well for themselves. But when I met her, I didn't realize that. Like, I didn't realize, you know, you, people would say she came from money, right? She like, that's what people would say is like, she came from money is, is a, is a good way to put it. Um, but I never realized that until I met her family 
we hung out for, you know, probably, I don't know, two, three months before I went and met her family. I met her family on a Chris, on Christmas the, within a few months of dating her. When I, I remember pulling up to her house and I was just thinking to myself, like, holy shit, like, this is a nice house. Like, this, <laughs> yeah, this is like crazy. Like, this is like they had a pool in the backyard, like this, like, waterfall cave, like it, this crazy house. And all the, they all have like super nice cars. And we go out to this real nice dinner and it's just like real crazy experience. I'm like, what the hell? And the who reason, is she? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Who is she? And the reason why it threw me off is because she was, she was just so humble. And so, like, down to earth and just quiet. Like, I never, never picked that up from, and I, and I can read people from a mile away, but for some reason with her, I just, I never caught that. I never realized that she, she was like that. So that kind of was really cool to see. And, you know, just seeing her interaction with her parents, like I said, with, when I say she's everything that I'm not, she's got this, you know, she's genuinely happy. And I see her interact with her parents. She's happy, you know, she has, brothers and sisters and they've got this big happy family her grandma is like the sweetest lady in the world and um i'm just so glad to be with her because i get to be a part of all these other pieces as well so me and her dad have a have a pretty good relationship me and her whole family i I would say have a really good relationship but especially her her grandmother she's like the sweetest lady because i'm with my wife my kids get to experience this big family you know and and my kids have never met my family. You know, they've met my brother, but that's it. So they don't know my mom. They don't know anybody else. My dad, they don't know anybody else in my family. And they haven't asked, they kind of ask questions now. But to answer your question, that's, you know, that's kind of what my wife has done for me is she's, she is just everything that I'm not. I've had all these problems. She has not. And so it's just kind of like this completing the puzzle, you know, the, all these missing pieces that I have, she's kind of able to fill that void. It's not been easy. Like marriage never is. Marriage is very hard, but you have to be intentional and you have to be smart and respectable and, and you have to be able to talk to each other and communicate and, and we're able to do that, you know, despite getting mad at each other occasionally, uh, we're able to, you know, sort through our differences and basically just tell each other like, Hey, like you did this and it pissed me off. Mm-hmm. and this is why you know and then i tell her the same thing well okay well i'm sorry that happened and then if something happens with me i tell her but yeah she's just she's just everything that i'm not you know and and she that's kind of what happened i you know like i said she was humble she was good looking and down to earth and all these different things and so it just kind of uh i don't know why I like i mean i guess that's that's why i settled or i well i say settled but not settled but settled down with her right that's yes. why i kind of you felt she was like the one, it was so. it was time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. So I we got, so we got moved married right now, like yeah. uh, from 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 whatever you you mentioned in the first the first part of your story, and then to now, and this is why, I'm like, okay, I I want to know <laughs> genuinely for me, like this is me, this is off script for those yeah. listening. <laughs> We're just having a a conversation. So okay, how do you think communication? I was saying, how do you think? How important is communication with your partner, especially when you, 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 like you mentioned before, you you didn't even go through therapy. So a lot of these, you have to work them out by yourself. And that must be tough. How important do you think that is? And what what were the challenges that you have talking about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the communication part is, is really important because... Like, uh, for example, when me and my wife first started dating, I have different tendencies. I have different reactions and different, like, opinions about things, about life, because of the experiences that I have, right? Um, I have a completely different perspective on life compared to my wife. We just see things differently because we've been, we grew up differently, and that's just the nature of it. So unless we communicate with one another and understand why she sees things a certain way and why I see things a certain way. We're never going to like mesh. I mean, me and my wife are, are completely on complete opposite ends of the spectrum as far as like people and how we grew up. Even today, like we're not that much alike. We have some similarities, but you know, if we are, we're just very different people and, and that's okay. The The communication part, you have to, so, you know, because you have had a hard time or you've had a hard life or you've gone through something traumatic, the world doesn't owe you any favors and Mm. it's not the world's responsibility to walk around on eggshells. Right. So I can't 
go through my relationship with my wife or my children or anybody, even other family members, and expect them to just tiptoe because I've had a hard time. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a victim mentality. You can't do that. You can't walk around and say, well, you don't know me. You don't know what I've been through. Mm. And that gives me the right to be upset about anything I want to be upset about. And it's like, no, that's to not act how the this way works. that you, that, that you're acting. Yeah, exactly. And so people who have, and I, and I did that for a long time, like just to be clear for a very long time, I was very much like that. Like, you don't know me. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what it's like. So I can do whatever and say whatever I want. Because I've had a harder life than you. And I mean, as a young man, I got a lot of credit for like being this honest person. But I wasn't just honest. I was an asshole. And you can be candid and you can be honest about things and not be an asshole and just trying to piss people off. So that's what I did for a long time. And it eventually took me like reading some books about leadership and psychology and things like that to understand that. I was just being an asshole, you know? And so for, for my wife and in my family and, and her family and all that, you have to have those conversations and let them know like, Hey, like this is what happened to me. So sometimes I do feel this way. I'm not justifying it, but sometimes like these things happen and I don't know why, but my brain just, just takes me to this place. And when you're able to have that open, open dialogue and conversation, it is hard, very hard for me to do with my wife for some reason, you know, it's that, She's the closest person to me. And so sometimes it's kind of hard to connect on that level. Yeah, it's just it's just different talking to her about a lot of things. You know, you're you don't want to be like or weak or anything like that. You know, like you want to be this like strong, trusted person and, and I'm with her all the time. And so you know, you you start opening up those doors and she starts to figure out like where your problems are and she's she's with you every day. I can have this conversation I have this conversation with you and we may never talk again, right? We may go our separate ways and boom. Mm-hmm. So like, I don't have to look at you every day like, hey, we just had this conversation. Yeah. Like you know, like <laughs> exactly. you know, that was that was hard. That was tough. So yeah. the the communication is very important. Like I said, you can't go through life not talking about your problems and expecting everybody in the world to know you, understand you, and then tiptoe around you. If you want people to help you and tiptoe and understand you, you have to talk to them. And that's just the most important thing you can do. Wow. Wow. Thank you. I have nothing to add to that. And you mentioned about reading leadership books. What did you read and what did you find out? Like, how did your perspective change? Yeah, so a couple of books that I really picked up on. Uh, one of them is a pretty typical book. is It's called Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink, which is like a standard like practice leadership. Um, I haven't anybody read it. Who, yeah, anybody <laughs> anybody who wants to like understand themselves and and own their lives and and be a better person, be a better leader, can read it. Even though it's written by a Navy SEAL and it's very like hardcore. Anybody can anybody can learn from that, and he teaches his principles to every big company in the world. Like they go out and they train anybody on their principles because they're able to apply it to business and life and and everything. So he's writing children's books and everything now. Well, um, okay. Ba- okay. Yeah, ba- yeah. Ba- can you repeat that? Extreme ownership by Yep, Go Willink. Yeah, Jacko Willink. Okay, I think I've I've, I've yep. got you. Person. Yeah. Okay. If you if you yeah you Google extreme ownership, it'll be the first thing you see. It'll, okay. it'll pop up immediately. But it's just a really good book. It just tells you it talks to you about like your ego getting in the way, and that's what I read when I was like twenty twenty two twenty three or so, right before my daughter was born. I read that book, and he's basically telling you like it doesn't matter what happened to you. It doesn't matter who you think you are. It doesn't matter like you you know because a lot of people their their ego gets in the way, and and I was one of those people. I just like I said, I had this thing on my shoulder. Like I've been, I know what I've been through in my life, and I know you have. Therefore, been like it. you, yeah, it's like you feel you walk around feeling entitled to, to yep. people. Like you, you need to treat me better because you don't know what I've been through. Exactly, and I'm, and I'm pretty sure you will not even survive. <laughs> if you had to go through what I had to go through. Exactly. And so that's what people do, right? And so with, with that, he just talks a lot about different things. You know, you may have a bad interaction with somebody and somebody can say, well, that person hates me. And it's like, well, how do you know they hate you? It's like, well, I just do. It's like, well, have they told you that? And it's like, no. Well, it's like, 
well then how do you know and it's like well i just do and it's, so you have to eliminate that and that what that is is your, it's your ego talking it's you saying i know because i know that's that's mm. the only justification that i have is that i just know which is that's your ego talking and, and you've got to get rid of that so you know it, it's a really good like mental thing it just teaches you to you know think positively about situations as well if somebody says something negative towards you or about you or they act a certain way and it kind of throws you off there's a positive spin you can always put on it like oh, maybe they're having a bad day or maybe this happened maybe that happened you, you just don't know the whole story so unless you do you can't paint that picture because if you do you start to send yourself down a bad path and so his books it's a very good leadership book it's about it's all just about owning it doesn't matter what happens to you it's your responsibility on how you respond, right? So extreme ownership is not just saying everything is my fault. It's, this is what I'm going to do to fix the problem. So if somebody drives into your car, that's not your fault, and that does suck. But what are you going to do moving forward? Like that's the ownership portion, the accounting. And so that's like with life, right? If somebody does something to you, what are you going to do moving forward? Are you going to like blame this person well the blame doesn't get you anywhere uh you can blame them all day long but it doesn't get you anywhere so you might as well own it just take responsibility for what happens from that point forward because you can't change the past you can only impact how you you know and so for example like today kind of a crazy situation we have a we have a beard or dragon like a lizard and oh. we were, we were outside <laughs> running we were outside running around with him and uh, my daughter got too close and was he was being crazy anyways and he bit the he bit her on the finger. Oh no! And he actually, yeah, he actually took a chunk off the the end of her finger. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, it was bleeding pretty bad. And so, like, we come inside, and uh, it was real hectic. You know, it, it wasn't terrible, but my wife was taking care of her, and we're both at the sink. And my wife said something. My daughter was screaming, so I I kind of said something to my wife. My wife said something back to me, and we're all like yelling at each other in the kitchen. You know, and I'm so, so the, sorry. This is not a funny. <laughs> It's not a funny no. situation, but, but I can imagine the household like. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but the reason why I bring that up is because when we we had plans because it's Mother's Day, so we were going to go and yes, and, it's and do Day. something, right? Yeah. So we go we go get in the car, and I just said, "Hey, look!" I said, "Listen, guys, what happened happened, right? It was scary. It hurt. You were bleeding. It's okay." I yelled. Mama yelled. We're not going to let this ruin our day. And and this is actually the first time I've ever done this, but it but I just said like, look, everybody's got a thermometer, right? Everybody's got the the th thermostat on the wall, right? And if you know you set the temperature, like if somebody comes in and turns it one way or another, and you don't like it, well, it's your responsibility to fix it, you know. And you can fix it. There's a multiple different ways you can do that, but you know, one of those things I did, I just sat in the car and I said, look, we're gonna have mm -hmm. a good day. Why? Because I love you guys, and we're, we're and it's Mother's Day. We're gonna go get some ice cream. We're gonna go up to the river and hang out, and boom, you know that's what we're gonna do. And so it, it kind of shifted the whole mood, and we did. We went up there, we had a good time, and and it, that was that, you know. So, but that's what the Extreme Ownership book is about. That's probably one of the best books you can read, in my opinion. That that really helped me kind of grow up and and understand that my past is not a is not a crutch. It's a tool. And everything that I've been through in my life is just it's just adding tools to the bag that I can use in certain situations. And it's it's tools and things that I can leverage that other people cannot. So if you have not been through what I've been through, um, that's OK. I have the ability to maybe reach certain people. Right. So if I go out and speak, I can relate to so many people. I can relate to people without fathers. I can relate to people who grew up around drugs and violence and abuse. I can relate to people who have been raped or sexually abused or molested. I can relate to so many so many different veterans, combat veterans. I, I can relate to so many people. So I'm using my past as a tool to advance my life forward now as opposed to, you know, sitting in it and sulking in it and crying about it because it's not going to get you anywhere. You have my ultimate respect all the way from Malaysia. Really sad. Ooh, I'm glad I had this conversation with you today. Okay, so maybe we can take back, take you, take our listeners back to the first part. Like, so if someone is, they not clinically diagnosed that they have depression or maybe having suicidal ideation, mm -hmm. how do you think, like, what what is your advice if there are people who find themselves like there's no way out? like right now one of the easiest things you can do um so like when i when i was bad and i i wanted to end things a lot of it was 
you just don't think you can make another day or you, you're just tired of going, you're just exhausted, you're tired of being here. So you have to find like a purpose. You have to find some sort of reason to be here and you have to keep executing on that, mm -hmm. right? And one of the easiest things to do for me was exercising. Like I physically, I just, I train all the time. I exercise all the time. And the reason why I say that is, it's easy. Even if you just go out and take a walk or you, or you work out in your garage or your house, or you go to a gym, things kind of build a routine. And so if you have a gym or a, a, a routine that you're following, like you've got to be there Monday, Wednesday, Friday, whatever, whatever your routine is, you have this calendar, you have these things that you got to show up for. And so it, it keeps you in that mind frame of like, I need to be here for tomorrow. I need to be there tomorrow. When people start, stop running out of things to do, and there's no reason for me to be here Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I don't have anything planned this whole week. Then you start to get lonely and you start to justify like, well, I don't, nobody's called me in a week. So I don't have, yeah, really, you know, I, no, I don't have a reason. I'm not worthy so, for people to hang exactly, out with me. Exactly. Exactly. So going to a gym is, is one of the best things you can do. You can build a community there like group fitness classes or like I do jujitsu. So I have my, my friends from jujitsu that I talk to pretty much every single day. And it's, it gives you that connectivity, that community as well. Right. So, but also it gives you the, the ability, right? So when I say Kitty, I think when we are capable humans, it, it builds confidence. And so what I mean by that is like, if I go to the gym, I can work out, right. And I'm a little bit stronger. Well, now I'm a little bit more capable than I was yesterday, purely on physical attributes, purely on being stronger. I can do more things. I can pick the laundry up and go up the stairs or I can, if we go outside, I can move things. I can do things. I can run. I can walk. I can climb mountains. When you do these physical things, it gives you, you're more capable in life. You are able to do more things. You may be able even to defend yourself. I can walk into a room, for example, and nine times out of 10, I can, I can pretty much hang with anybody in the room. I can survive, right? Whereas if you have no physical capabilities whatsoever and you've never trained anything and you walk into a room, you may not have like the negative thoughts or negative doubts. But for me, because I do, I just know I'm comfortable in my environment, right? So if, if I feel, if I walk into a gas station and somebody's being crazy, um, I know that if this guy gets out of hand, I can probably de-escalate the situation. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's a, it's a capability thing. What that does is it creates confidence. That knowing is just confidence, right? Oh, so I love that. Yeah, yes, you, you, that you work out. Exactly. So if you work out, you get stronger, you're more confident. You just are. It, it is a byproduct of, of going to the gym. You're going to get stronger and you're going to be more confident. It is inevitable. Uh, when you wake up and you work out early in the morning before work, well, now you've shown up to work and you've already worked out. And you look around, how many other, how many other people have worked out before, you know, uh, that day? And it's probably little to none. So it's that confidence factor of like, I did this, like I did something hard. When you do hard things, it builds character. You know, it's, it, it's, I mean, literally it's in our, it is in our DNA. It is in our, our, as a human, we are built to do and endure. And when, when you are able to suffer and you're able to endure the suffering that builds endurance. So the more you suffer, whether it's going to the gym or even if it's around the house, doing the dishes, doing the laundry, cleaning the whole house, the more you put yourself in that state of suffering of like going through pain or doing something that you don't want to do, it is building endurance. And as you build endurance, the more endurance you have, it's going to produce more and more character. And so what does that mean? It's just the, I have been through so much of my life that I have built this Im immense amount of endurance for a lot of things, you know, whether it's physically, emotionally, whatever, I can endure quite a bit as a man because of that. When these bad things happen, my character has already been tested, right? My character has already been built. So when these bad things happen, I'm good. Like I, I know I can get through this. As a matter of fact, I will look at other people sometimes thinking to myself, like, what, this is not that bad. Like you guys are okay. You can get through this. Mm -hmm. They just have not been through what I've been through. So, their mountain, their mountain might be here where mine is like maybe 20 stories higher, you know, because I've already endured so much of that pain. And so I have that character. The, the suffering produces endurance, which the endurance will turn into character. And character, when you are the strong, capable man or, you, or woman and you, and you have developed this character, it inspires other people, right? So when you see somebody that, that you really like, it's like, well, why do you really like that person? <laughs> well, that person has done this and this and this. Okay, so they've gone through it, right? They've suffered. 
right? And they've endured. And now they've turned into the person that you really um, admire. So that it's just a cycle. And that's how that's how it works. So um, yeah. thank yeah. you. I think I think it's also good for the listeners to not get confused with like because humans are wired to go towards pleasure and avoid pain and when you said the context of suffering it means like putting yourself uh, testing yourself to the limits going to the gym and not not in the sense that because suffering becoming a victim mentality of your past and that's suffering too but when when you say suffering it means um in this context is like really putting yourself up there because and you you know the good that will come out of it like yeah. working out even though you feel like it is the worst day to work out but you show up anyway you show up anyway so that's that's the kind of um activities or the kind of mindset that builds your resilience and 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 endurance to be honest once you get through that and you do it um consider however whatever in whatever frequency that, that you have set for yourself it will pay off even though you, you see that okay right now i've just okay let's say a person says i want to start running at least one kilometers or just walk and that one day you take that walk even though it's rainy or it's drizzling, you still go out there. But then you, you'll, you'll experience something because having this, it's like I said, we are wired to just go towards pleasure. We do not want to feel pain. And it's different when somebody has gone through, you know, top uh, military training. Like I've, I've known people who've gone through that and innately it is within them. Like there is yeah. no, no issue waking up at five o'clock. It is automatic. Like for for me, at least, I can't speak for everybody. It, that, I need to, to set my, my mind to, to, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So everybody's on their journey and everybody, it, it's in different, they, they have different circumstances. But like you mentioned also, everybody has that choice, right? At every moment. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, we, we are prepared to take the easy road uh, yes. that's human that's that's human nature right yes but it, that's the that is the uh you know what's the word for it uh paradox maybe of 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 it all because even though we're wired to take this easy route when we take that easy route we're not satisfied and it's just so uh, it, right. to be true uh that's... if you go give a toddler right go to a two-year-old and give a two-year-old everything they want just keep giving it to them and they become three, they become four, they become five. Just keep giving them everything they want. No matter what they want, give it to them. They're never satisfied. They never will be mm -hmm. because they don't understand the value of the suffering. They don't understand the value of the journey. And so when you put them through the journey and you put them through the hard times, uh, they become satisfied. That is, the, that is the satisfaction. It is not the getting what you want. It is, I accomplished something that was hard. Right, even for a toddler, for a, my daughter, for example, um, she is five, but soon to be six, and we've always gotten her water for her, right? Because she's not tall enough to reach and all those different things. Okay, so, but she now she is, and so instead of me going and getting her water, I'm like, no, like you can do it. And the first few times, it was frustrating, right? She's like, oh, I can't get the lid off, and I can't open the fridge, and I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And I said, well, if you can't do it, then you're not going to get any water because I know you can do it. You're just you're being a baby right now, you know, and, and she's, and she's five years old, you know? And so I had to hammer that home that like, you That's are more capable yeah. than you realize like mm. you and, you know, we, we go up to these mountains and we go crawl around these waterfalls and they're, they're five and they're three and we're on these steep rocks and it's slippery and it's wet and it's kind of dangerous. Maybe not, not crazy, but you know, they could fall and get hurt like anybody else. Um, and they're scared. You know, my daughter, she was coming down. We were up there last week and she's coming down the side of this, this rock. And she looks at me and she says, and she didn't, I don't think she was really thinking about this, but she just kind of said it out loud. She said, uh, this is my opportunity to be brave. She said, this is my chance to be brave wow. at five years old. And she was scared. You I know, had she was sitting, chills. <laughs> yeah. She was sitting down on the rock and she's got her hands down and she's like sliding down inch by inch. And I was not going to help her. I said, look, if you want to come down here, you can come down here, but you got to do it yourself. And, and when you, and that's that thing where if I would have just grabbed her and picked her up and put her down there, it, you know, sure. She would have happy, thought that, okay, but, there's always somebody who's going to catch me exactly. if I'm in, if I'm and, in, if I'm in trouble or if I got, yeah. if I cannot get through anything. Exactly. That's, that's character always, building. 
it, it <laughs> is. And, and anybody can do that, right? When the, like another thing I'll tell somebody is like, when the water is deep or the mud is thick and you feel like you can't get through it, the water's too deep, you're drowning or the mud is too thick and you just can't keep moving. Your legs are getting too heavy. Like you, life is testing you and you are on the, you're right there. Like you're on that last little bit that you got to go and you're about to be finished. You're about to be rewarded and life is going to reward you, but it is going to test you first. And without mm -hmm. the test, there is no reward. You may get nice things in life, but the, the test has to come first. And if you do not get the test, then you will not appreciate the reward that you receive in life. So, <clears throat> you know, this is all like, there's levels to this of, of building this character and resilience and, and this mental toughness. And, and you have to understand all of these things and you have to apply them every single day or as much as you possibly can. And the more that you apply them and the more that you push yourself, um, the, the, the farther you're going to go, you know? So it's, there's a lot to it, but it's, I've learned a lot in 29 years. I'm pretty, pretty happy with it. Wow. When you're, whenever, you, when you were explaining things, I was already thinking in my head, like, because I do this every day and then I have at least two interviews and sometimes, you know, I love talking to people, but then you cannot help. There are times when you feel like, do yeah. I really want to talk? <laughs> yeah. But then I, I get up and I, I, I still sit here and I say, I show up, Nicolette. There are people who's going to, who's, who, although they may not interact with you directly, but when they hear whatever that you're putting out there, probably it's going to help their, it's going to have improved their lives or just your message alone or the message of the speaker, the guest is going to help. So you have a bigger purpose than being yeah. a bum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so it's, it, and it's often, if, if, it's, if you think of it on, the other side like what are you giving back instead of you 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 why do i yep. need to do this then it shifts your perspective right because to me i think it's in giving that you feel fulfilled the most and also coming back to what you said the the, the rewards would be sweeter because you have gone through them yourself yeah yeah yep. so well thank you for that <clears throat> seth thank you so much okay a few more questions and <laughs> I can let you go. Thank you for sharing your story. Like, I, I really appreciate sure. it. Um, okay. So we're going to pivot to a self-worth question. And the question for you here, seeking external help, such as therapy or counseling, can be beneficial for addressing self-worth issues. Now, I understand you did not go through that, that route, but, um, that route. So, but what is your opinion? And if individuals are turning to this, how can they find the right resources and support for their needs? Uh, I think it's absolutely critical. All right. I think whether you get therapy or you have good friends that you can talk to. Um, the thing I'll say with that, like the caveat, the warning is if you're talking to your friends, you have to understand that you're talking to your friends. Okay. Mm. And you're not talking to a doctor. You're not talking to a therapist. So some of the things that they may say, <clears throat> may not make sense or it may offend you or it may come off a certain way. I think a lot of people who go through a lot of trauma, they'll say something or they'll announce something or they'll tell or their friends. they'll be biased something. because of the things that they've gone through. Yeah. Yeah. There's bias. And then mm -hmm. what will happen a lot of times is somebody will say, like, for example, when I tell my story that I was molested for six years, right. And I kept going back to this guy's house and it was my decision to go to his house. Kind of the, a lot of times people will almost immediately think, and they'll even say it. Well, why did you keep going back if you didn't like it? Which is a typical response. Thanks. And I have two options, right? I can get upset about that and be like, oh, why would you say that? And then I get all hurt and I'm all sad for a week. Or I can be like, look, this person has no idea how to talk to people. So I can't get mad at them when I drop this super heavy word on them oh. or this super heavy story and and they don't say what I want them to say, you know? You can't get mad at somebody if you just pour out a bunch of information and they don't say exactly what you needed, right? So that so when you're talking to your friends or even a therapist, you have to understand that just as we started this conversation, you were at a loss for words, right? There's like, what are you supposed to say when somebody tells you all that? You know, it's like, God, God, like, I don't know what to tell you, you know? And so for me, that I can never sit there. never happened. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, the, the people that I've interviewed, that has never happened to me. It's it's happened to me 
almost every time, right? Every time I tell my story, people are just like, whoa, like, wait a minute. Let me freaking digest this. When you're seeking help, you have to understand that they may not have the words for you. Then, it, you know, keep doing it and just trust the process. Because as I've talked about it, I have, it's like taking a knife out of the body every time. If I have a hundred knives in me, every one of them that I get rid of, it just feels better and better, right? To get rid of that message. So you have to trust the process. There's a reason why people do therapy. And a lot of times when somebody shows up, they're upset because the first two, three sessions, they weren't given the they weren't given the secret to life, you know, mm. they, they expect to go into therapy and be like, okay, I'm I good the next cured. day. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'm cured. Right. Like that's not how it works. It takes time. And although I've never gotten any formal therapy, I've been doing podcasts and interviews now for the last like three or four months. And uh, it's been very therapeutic for me because I'm able to get on here, have this conversation with you and, and talk about it and process what happened. And, you know, you're just removing that knife every time. So whether you get formal therapy or talking to a friend or a trusted, you know, somebody you can trust and, and confide in, you need to talk, you need to like decompress and get those feelings out of your body and say those things. For me, generally, I, I talk very viscerally and raw and I will tell anybody the darkest details they want to hear. I mean, there's some really nasty, dark details in my story and if people really want to get into it, then we can. If they don't, that's fine too. You know, uh, it just helps me heal. Like it helps, it just helps. So that's yeah. my answer on the therapy question. Go get it. Thank you. Just by talking yeah. that, that can, that can save people's lives. Like it can save your life. To be honest, I started podcasting as well because it's therapeutic for me because I yeah. want to, I want to know if, why me or is it only me that is experiencing this thing now you are by far the <laughs> if i'm if i if, if there's a podcast i will remember the for the people that i've interviewed it would be you would be on the top yeah <laughs> because of the the things that you've shared and how much you've healed seth yeah i can tell when you're talking i am in awe and i'm like he has gone through so much but then the way he's so composed here in front of me and you can tell when somebody has done their work, their inner yeah. work, because it's not projected at all. Yeah. <sighs> Thank you, Seth. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. For, for, for doing the work. Because when you're doing the work, it, it impacts me. We, we didn't even know that we existed before this interview. But right now, I'm going to walk away from this conversation with my mind in perspective yeah. change. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> What is your heart's greatest wish, Seth? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the biggest thing that I can do, the, my biggest wish is to get my story out there <clears throat> for other people. Every time I've told my story is I get incredible feedback every single time. Every time I tell it, I get feedback from so many people about how powerful it is and and you know, how much it's moved somebody, how good somebody feels about it, standing that you can go through all these traumatic things in life and, and still survive. And the reason why I'm talking, telling my story now too, is, is I, I had to come to a realization. It's not about me anymore. It's not about what I went through. It's about what I can do to help others get through their problems. And, you know, there's 7 billion people in the world or whatever, like how many more of them can I help? Like, that's what I have to do at this point. I have to help other people. So there's so many kids who are going through what I went through and, and much worse than what I went through, right? They feel alone, worthless. Uh, they don't matter because they're being treated the way they are, whether they're five, six years old and they're addicted to drugs already. They're already being hooked on drugs and, and being trafficked around the world. Uh, there's That's happening. And so if I can find those people and help them heal, that that is my wish. That's my my heart's biggest wish is to be able to reach these people and pour my love into them and my, my story and, and inspire them, you know, to not be a statistic. They can grow up and they can still do amazing things in this world, just as I have. Thank you. Is there a mantra that you live by? A mantra? I don't think so. I mean, I have a few things that I stick to, which is like understanding perspective, perspective and gratitude. If you are able to, I think you gain perspective two ways. You can either gain it through experience, whether you're born into a situation or you seek experience. So, for example, I was born into a bad situation, so I have that great, I have that 
perspective of all the bad things, but I've also done a lot of great things that I've seeked out. I've been all I've been all around the world. I've you know been to top of the Eiffel Tower and freaking New York City and like all these. I've been to all over Europe, Africa, Afghanistan, Dominican Republic. I've seen some of the most beautiful parts of the world and some of the worst. So my perspective on life is is quite unique compared to most people. Uh, then also you could do a podcast, right? And as you do a podcast, you you start to see other parts of the of the world and of life, and you can gain that perspective. And with perspective, you can be more grateful. You can have more gratitude in your life, right? Where and it's not just saying like I'm grateful I never went through that, but it's understanding that like life is beautiful. Yes. The things that we have are is beautiful. The the, the the opportunity that I get to wake up every day and do the things that I want. I mean, we're sitting here talking on a on you know virtual podcast. Technology, yeah, thousands I mean, of miles it, apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, life is beautiful. Like this yes. is an insane time to be alive, and so it gives you that gratitude when you don't understand like how dark and twisted the world can be. Um, it's hard to really understand the gratitude that you can possess, but with perspective and gratitude, it helps build a stronger you, right? You, mentally, physically, emotionally, when you're able to express gratitude, just like I did today, my daughter got bit by the lizard and we get in the car and everybody's screaming and crying and everybody's mad. Me and my wife yelled at each other. I get in the car and I'm like, you know what? I love you guys. Like we're going to get through this and today's going to be a good day because I said so. Mm-hmm. And so you're able to, you're able to use that gratitude of, of just being present with one another and being proud of one another and, and be strong, you know? So the perspective plus gratitude is, is a formula for strength. It equals strength mentally, emotionally, physically, you're able to do those things. So that is like my, that's like one of my, one of my uh, uh, talking points. Thank you. Perspective. Yeah. Even gratitude. Yeah. Is there anything that keeps you up at night or do you sleep well? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing a lot right now. So a lot of the, a lot of the things keep me up at the moment. Uh, you know, as long as I turn my, as long as I put my phone down and I've, as long as I don't start scrolling, I'm pretty much, I'm good. Kind of get up early so I'm, I'm usually pretty tired at night uh, the things that do keep me up are like i'm just you know i'm writing a book and so my book stuff i'm working on my branding and so for example last night i was thinking about different names for my business that i'm going to start with my speaking and kind of how to brand it and title it yeah so i was kind of like you know counting the sheep in my <laughs> head trying to go to sleep because i do get kind of caught up with that those are kind of small things, though. Nothing serious. Occasionally, I'll hear the ice maker in the refrigerator, oh. and I think I think somebody's breaking in the house, and then I'm awake for <laughs> next hour. But no, um, now I, you know, things have come together for me, so I'm very happy about a lot of things. So I'm doing yeah, good. I, I can feel that. I can feel that good things are happening. The stars are yeah. aligning. <laughs> they are finally. Yeah. Yes. Okay, Seth, if you could create a quote right now for you to leave to the audience listening and the world as your legacy, what would it be? A quote for my legacy. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I like the, um, you know, it's kind of maybe a little repetitive, but I like the, you know, endure, you know, endure. Like, you have to endure. Like, to endure is to is to survive is to suffer, is to go through pain, is to, you know, make it and, and, and get through hard times. Like you have to endure So to endure, you know, endure the suffering and, and creates endurance. Once again, that endurance creates character and that character inspires hope, inspires hope in other men. You know, that suffering creates endurance, creates character and character creates hope in other men. That's, that's what I would leave. That's what I hope people see from me is the amount of suffering that I've gone through and the amount of endurance that I have now, like in the character that I, the, who I am today to inspire others. Like you can do this, whether you are intentionally suffering via the gym or work or you're running a business or it is put upon you, you know, whether you get a flat tire, build your coffee, somebody, you know, kills somebody in your family or you lose somebody or something happens, somebody dies. Whether that suffering's intentional or by chance, then you can endure it, and you you know you come out on the other end a good, positive person. So the, that's what that's what I would leave as far as my quote goes. Powerful. Enough said. That's, yeah, enough said. Yeah, enough said. So, Seth, how can people reach out to you? Yeah, the easiest way to reach out to me is uh, YouTube and Instagram. Instagram is really the biggest one. 
Uh, if you look me up, Seth Gale, my last name is G-E-H-L-E. Um, so, but yeah, Seth Gale, uh, my Instagram is go beyond the shadows, um, uh, which is based off the title of my book, strength <laughs> beyond the shadows. So, yeah. So go beyond the shadows is my YouTube and my Instagram. But you, if you Google my name, you'll, you'll see, I have, it'll pop up. My Instagram will pop up. My YouTube will pop up. Uh, I have a website as well, um, which is just sethgale.com. And then, um, you know, if anybody follows along on Instagram, they'll see a lot more content like this. And then they will also see my book and everything like that when it comes out and, and in, anything else I'm doing as far as speaking, uh, engagements, things like that goes. So that's, a, that's the easiest way to get a hold of me is Instagram. Okay. Thank you. And there you have it, guys. You heard it from Seth himself. Before we close off, Seth, I'd like to thank you personally for the work that you're doing for the world and your community around you and for advancing every step of the way despite the challenges, creating trails for those that will come after you. So for the listeners, this has been that one podcast with that controversial name, <laughs> You're Worthless. Read that again, the juxtaposition of your very soul. Now, if you find yourself thinking that you are worthless, you are not alone. Most importantly, ask yourself a level deeper. If I am worthless, then why the heck am I here? It is because your soul have chosen to be here energetically all the way from the ethers. And for that reason itself, you are worthy. And you're enough. This has been Seth Gale, your guest of the day, and Nick Nyaras, your host, signing off.